welcome to the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors UK and Ireland uh, talk to internal audit session. I hope you've grabbed your coffee. I've got coffee today. I thought water was a bit boring. I seem to have water all the time, so I thought I'd have coffee today. Um, and join us for a um, conversation around cybersecurity and remote working. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Institute, perhaps I could start by introducing you to the Institute and who I am, of course. So I'm Liz Sandwith and I'm the Chief Professional Practices Advisor. I um, work for the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors, UK and Ireland, and we have approximately 10,000 members across all sectors and across all geographical locations. Um, we are also part of a global body, IIA Global, who has over 200,000 members in 170 different countries. So when you go on holiday, assuming we ever go on holiday again, um, make sure that you just check, you know, those afternoons when you've had enough sitting in the sun, have a look and see whether the country you're in has its own institute. And if it has, reach out. Think how wonderful it would be to take your family to an institute uh, of internal auditors evening in whatever location you're in. I am joking, but we have that breadth. So today I want to talk about cybersecurity and remote working. As you will all know, communication is central to our working lives and social distancing has increased the need for the virtual networks. There is lots and lots of choice out there on the market, but it's important that the organizations you work for are very clear about the tools that you are supposed to use. So the Institute um, has adopted MS Teams and Zoom as its key products for virtual communication. We also need to think as internal auditors, why wouldn't we, about controls and risk and think about the approach in terms of preventing employees making their own choices. So, um, Anton, who's one of my colleagues in the marketing section, and I had a little bit of a conversation because Facebook changed. I used to be able to access Facebook through Google. And then a couple of weeks ago, we changed, it changed and we have to go in through Firefox. I didn't know nothing about Firefox. Anton said to me, it's fine, not a problem, Liz, load it. <laughs> I'm an internal auditor, slightly cautious. Um, so I reached out to uh, an IT director and said, you know, is Firefox okay? And he said, yes, so I'm now talking to you on Facebook via Firefox. But we need to be sure that we question and challenge and that we make sure we're using the right products um, for our members of staff when they are working remotely. And remotely doesn't have to just be at home. I know when we first, um, at the Institute, when we first went into lockdown, um, I remember, raising Anton's name again. Anton talked to me about there was a park near where he worked and he was saying if it was a sunny day that he would be able to work in the park uh, because the Wi-Fi was okay, but there was a bandstand and if it rained, he'd be able to work in the bandstand. I don't think any of us anticipated how draconian the lockdown was in the first instance, but remote working could be from anywhere. So we need to factor that in. So. Remote working, because of the pandemic, heightens existing cyber risk, as you would expect it would, and, in, in, uh, and introduces a number of risks to organisations. The key assurance questions for boards and us as internal auditors is whether the internal control environment is sufficiently robust to protect the organisation during this time. So what I thought would be quite fun, um, is that I'm going to ask you to tell me um, some of your funny stories around um, remote working, virtual working. So I think there was um, um, a, an instance where somebody very important was giving a, a talk, a presentation, and their child came in, and then you saw this arm grabbing the child and pulling it out of the room. 
my husband tends to walk in quite often when I'm doing um, virtual events uh, and people have started calling him Mr. Liz. So I call him that now. So if you've got some funny events, funny glitches that you've had, share them with us through the, the comment section and wait for it. We'll have a prize next week and um, for the funniest story. And we'll tell you the prize next week. So join us next week to find out A, if you've won and B, what the prize is. Um, so what I wanted then to go on, so, you know, a little bit less fun now, but let's think about cyber and remote working and the challenges. Uh, some of the data on the internet, I'm sure lots of you will have seen, is that phishing emails have increased by over 600%. And as with the COVID-19 virus, none of us are immune. So it's a constant challenge to remind your staff, remind your organization that they have to be careful. Um, there was a brilliant example, wasn't there, of a, um, an organization where they'd had um, an email purporting to come from the CEO, and it looked as though it did, asking for 30,000 pounds to be transferred um, into a bank, account details provided immediately. Um, and the staff knew the CEO was, was away working abroad. Uh, and so immediately their thinking was, yes, we must do this. But then somebody noticed at the bottom, it said, thank you before the name of the CEO. And they said, this has got to be a phishing email because our CEO never says thank you. So how do we make sure that our staff stop a moment and think about, you know, is this a genuine email? Do we need to worry about it? So there are lots and lots of controls, as you would expect, depending on the organization, the size of the organization, the sector, the maturity, and they may or may not all be possible at the moment. So we have to think at the moment pragmatic and the key controls that will protect our organizations. So things like they need to be alert to cyber issues, hyper vigilant around phishing attacks, and particularly be mindful of sensitive data. They also need to be mindful of commercially sensitive data. So not just information about me, who Liz is, maybe what my bank account details are, what my um, religion is or, or whatever, but actually commercially sensitive data as well. Information that if it fell into the hands of your competitors could influence how your competitors perhaps change their approach. So two things we need to think about there. So what sort of controls can we think about when we think about phishing? Remind our staff of the dangers. So I'll give you a, a, an interesting example. Some time ago, maybe you remember when um, Donald Trump was standing for the presidential elections, there was um, a, an email, I got an email, um, that said um, it purported to come from Fox in the US um, that Hillary Clinton had died. And I clicked on that. I was the only one in the Institute that clicked on it. Um, and then suddenly we all got a, a reminder to, to do a, a piece of training around phishing emails because I was the idiot that clicked on finding out how Hillary Clinton had died. So again, just please be mindful, but make sure that we've got some um, plan B in place. If somebody does this, what can we do immediately to remind them of the, of the protocols? And e-learning, online learning, um, very short, sharp, maybe 15 minutes is a really good way of doing that. Responses, come, um, emotional responses. So. If people get um, a communication that's unexpected, think of my Hillary Clinton one, it can trigger an emotional response and then people forget to check all of the key indicators that would tell people whether or not this was false, false or not. Think about things like donations. HMRC seem to be um, one of the um, tools that people use uh, saying you're due a refund. It's coming from HMRC, you're due a tax refund, click on this and then input your financial details and you get the refund. It's not true. So be careful about that. Free voucher offers from supermarkets or others. Um, financial support from government, apply for this grant or that grant, whatever. So think about all of that. There's an MP, um, a Mr. Dean Russell, who's a member of the Health and Social Care 
Select Committee. And he made a statement, and I just want to read it for you. He says, this is a new low for cyber criminals who are acting like piranha fish, cowardly attacking people en masse when they are at their most vulnerable. It is vital that the public remain vigilant against scam emails during this challenging time. And it really is a challenging time. And we need to be able to support both our organization as internal auditors, but also make sure that we've got policies, procedures, reminders that go out on a regular basis to staff. In the days, and remember I am a more mature lady, in the days um, when you used to have mouse mats, I can remember when I worked for a media company um, and we'd had um, the terrorist attack in London, we created some mouse mats for everyone to remind them of the things they needed to look out for. So it was there um, on their desk all of the time. Those sorts of tools are not necessarily readily available at the moment, um, or indeed current business practice. But maybe we need to rethink some of the things from the past that worked and see whether we they work for the future. So while some organizations were absolutely geared up to people working from home, if you look in the financial services sector, uh, and my son works in the financial services sector, one of the things absolutely that was forbidden was working from home. People never even asked if they could work from home. Maybe they had to do some research or write a report. People didn't ask those questions because they knew the answer was always going to be no. So if the plumber was coming, if you had a dental appointment in the afternoon, people just used to take annual leave because that was the only way it would work. So suddenly, huge groups of um, employees and organizations who had never done this before, suddenly had to find a way to make it possible for their workforce to work from home. I'm chair of an audit and risk committee in a housing association. And we haven't had custom and practice um, of people working from home, but very quickly, and, I, and I'm talking maybe 10 days at the most, I think perhaps even less than 10 days, we set up people so they could deal with customer inquiries, book um, visits for people who needed repairs doing, and communicate with each other in a very short space of time. Uh, and those are the things that are important because often, uh, and it's true across a lot of things, not just remote working or cyber, it's across a lot of things. When you are in a crisis situation, sometimes decisions are made that perhaps in hindsight are not the best decisions, but decisions are made for the here and now. And I am certain that when we start looking back on some of the decisions that we have made during the last 10 weeks and maybe further forward, there will be questions asked about whether they were the right ones. But as long as we learn the lessons, that's fine. So remote working is really going to be, um, I think, a thing of the future. Uh, I was on a, a, a breakfast briefing this morning uh, and there was a, a gentleman from the insurance sector and they'd done a poll with staff. And he said 15% of them never want to set foot in the office again. 15% of them can't get back fast enough. And the majority, so the other 70%, were quite relaxed about whether they were going to work from home or work in the office. And what they were saying was, we suddenly started looking at all our buildings and saying, actually, do we need these buildings that seat 500 people? Maybe a building that will seat 100 people is enough, and then we can rotate people. So. Remote working and the challenges around that is, is very much going to be something that's going to be here and in the future, I think, as well as in the here and now. So going back to some things around controls. So if you're thinking about remote working, have we got a, a really strong uh, remote working policy? Has internal audit had a look at it? Have we been through it? Um, does it make sense? Is it practical? Is it pragmatic? Um, because perfect world may not be where we are at the moment. So we need to think about that. The other thing we need to think about is, I'm very fortunate. I have um, a little office in, in our house uh, and therefore my, my material, my laptop, all of that is safe and secure. But if I was living in a flat with uh, friends, 
you know, we need to think about if I um, leave my laptop, can other people access it? Children, you know, if I um, leave the room, could my granddaughter um, or my grandson or my great granddaughter have access to it and find that they're suddenly, um, you know, you're, you're on things that you weren't expecting to be on um, that could compromise your um, organization's framework. So, you know, we need to think about that. They also need to be locked away at the end of the day. So, you know, where and how do you lock them away? Do you switch your machine off? Do you take it out of public view if it's sitting in front of a window? Um, put it under your bed. Um, where do you put your um, your devices to make sure that they are um, very much out of the public gaze? So, as I said, we need to remind employees to maintain professional boundaries um, in terms of what are they doing. So, if they're doing private browsing, do they use work laptop? Does your organization allow that? Do they come out of the VPN and then go on to the network? And for the business work, do you use VPNs and things like that to protect the content? Remember what I said at the beginning about personal data and also commercially sensitive data. So we need to factor that in. Have we made sure that we have enough IT support if our um, people working remotely have problems? It's no good asking people to work remotely without having an IT network that will support them when they have problems, when they can't access anything, forgotten their password or whatever that might be. So we also need to think about what level of IT support. So if you have furloughed some of your IT team, is the skeleton IT resource available um, with the appropriate skills to help in these particular scenarios, i.e. the remote working scenario and help people um, if they have issues? Might we consider restricting access to sensitive personal data? So for example, your HR function, um, you know, do they need access to all of the employee's personal records, all copies of uh, contracts of employment, all copies of performance appraisals, disciplinaries, those sorts of things? Or could we restrict access to maybe current year or certain individuals uh, and make it so that the more sensitive stuff is behind another wall in terms of access rights and privileges. We also need to think about, um, as I said to you, GDPR, but what about payment card? So does your organization take payments from its customers? Um, one of the um, speakers on the um, breakfast briefing this morning uh, was talking about all of the controls that they've had to put in place because they have, I think he said, about a dozen customers who pay by check. Uh, and he said, you wouldn't believe the controls that we've had to put in place to receive those checks and then bank those checks. Um, and he was saying, it may sound harsh, but moving forward, he said, I'm going to suggest that we just refuse to accept checks. And if that means we lose some customers, then so be it. But the amount of process and control around accepting a dozen checks a year it's just not worth the risk or the effort. So, you know, that's going to happen, I think, as we move forward. Some of the learnings that's going to come from remote working, we're going to get some perspective on processes, issues, challenges that we are facing. So we need to think about that. We need to think about, you know, challenges, as I said, around taking credit card payments. You know, how do you do that? Do the people who do it, are they normally the people that would do it? Um, I was talking to a head of audit the other day and he was saying in their organization, they have done an awful lot of retraining and they have retrained something like 25% of their workforce. So they are capable of doing different jobs within the space of two weeks. Now, in the concept of that is great, absolutely. But let's just think real world, you know, retraining someone to do a different new role in two weeks, that's a big ask. And are there potential control issues that we need to think about there? So although some of this sounds really great, we as internal audit need to act sometimes as a conscience of the organization. 
and suggest perhaps that you know if you're going to adopt this approach you give them a buddy you assign them a supervisor so that in the initial period when they are living this new role they've just been retrained for they have some supervision some support some guidance to make sure that they do the right thing uh, across um, all of the the areas that they are now um, have been set up to work on we also need to think about from an internal audit perspective how can we ensure that processes are being complied with when people work remotely so <clears throat> what's our control environment what things are in place that we can check in terms of being certain that our people are operating appropriately i have a mnemonic for control environment i have to write it down otherwise i forget it um i forget what the order of the words so i have a mnemonic for the control environment called mohican and that's management's philosophy and operating style so what is your directors, your CEO, what are they saying at the moment around homeworking? What is their risk tolerance levels if things go slightly wrong? The O in Mohican is the organizational structure. Have you had to change your organizational structure to accommodate remote working? How is it um, structured? Are you reporting to different people? Has somebody assumed customer services perhaps who wasn't normally responsible for that area? And therefore, do they need to have a better understanding of the function of the organ of, of that element of the organization? The H in Mohican, HR policies and procedures. We are in crisis management. We are in a very different operating world. We are working remotely, but we still need HR policies and procedures that cover recruitment, that cover disciplinary and cover um, you know, terminations, um, whatever course of action needs to be taken, those still apply. And if people behave inappropriately, they need to know there are consequences attached to that, just as they were um, prior to the lockdown in March. I, integrity and ethical values. Um, I think this is particularly important. And, you know, we need to make sure that we have those frameworks in place that rely on people to behave appropriately. And that sits with the values of your organization and the culture of your organization. So perhaps now is a good time for the organization to remind its remote workers that what the values of the organization are, what the purpose of the organization is, why we're here, and what perhaps the future of the organization is going to look like um, when we start to ease the lockdown and some of our organizations start to adopt a, a new normal, if you're going to use that expression, but a return to some form of recognizable operating framework. The C is competent. Are our people competent? Remember what I mentioned earlier about people being re retrained very quickly? Do we know that our people are competent to do the job? And have we put a competency framework in place that equips them with that? Um, it's unfair to ask people to do something that they're not properly trained to do. The A is authority, assignment of authority and responsibility. And that is quite key in terms of the current environment. Some of the decision makers will be new decision makers. They'll be decision makers in the front line, not necessarily quite so senior as in the past. So do they know what's expected of them? And then the N, the N is the non-exec director. So your audit committee, do they know what's going on? Are we as internal audit briefing them around Mohican and our control environment and providing them with some level of assurance that we need to think about? So let's think about the future and how that's going to look as we start thinking about the new world, both of internal audit and our organizations. COVID-19 has brought many challenges to organizations, but obviously huge opportunities to be game changers. And one of the things I'm really keen for is that the profession of internal audit goes through that game changer moment and comes out of this COVID scenario with different um, approaches, different methodologies, different frameworks that enables it to be so relevant to your organization and so fit for purpose that it is adding value almost with every breath it breathes. 
Um, we need to think about um, the, the challenges moving forward. There seems to be general feeling that there's going to be another lockdown, whether it's localized um, because they, they worry about a spike um, in the COVID-19 uh, virus. So what did we learn from the here and now? Have we added that learning into a future scenario when we are back perhaps in lockdown so that we are even better organized, more efficient, more effective than we've been currently. So what are other lessons that we've learned? I also want to mention to you just a, a small reminder. There is um, our annual conference, as you will be aware, in September, and we are intending to capture lots of these game changer opportunities, looking to see what the future holds and how we can learn from the here and now. And there will be a number of streams around cybersecurity. So if you haven't signed up but are keen to sign up or thinking about signing up, then please have a look at our website and, and sign up for the conference. It's going to be virtual, so you'll be able to join the conference from your front room with your cup of coffee. Um, but please have a look at it. Have a look at the, the uh, agenda, the program, because it's really quite exciting and, and I think you will find it will um, really help you. The other thing I wanted to say is Anton has very kindly agreed in the comments to provide a link to a podcast. Um, we did a podcast on cybersecurity, so you will be able to access that link um, when you click on it. Um, post this um, post the end of this uh, live session so please bear that in mind because it's a very good podcast and I'm sure it will tell you way more than I've told you um, but certainly worth listening to and they it's about 20 minutes so it, it's not a hugely lengthy one so in, in conclusion what do I want to remind you of um, the live stream is available so friends family um, you know, make sure that you remind them that they can access the live stream via the uh, Chartered Institute's Facebook uh, page. Um, have a look and see all of the really exciting things that we're doing at the moment uh, via our website, via Facebook, via Twitter, via LinkedIn. And please, if you haven't, have a look at our COVID-19 hub. There is lots of uh, free uh, guidance, blogs, um, all sorts of information, plus the notes from our Heads of Internal Audit uh, virtual forums that happen on a weekly basis. Lots of really good information there, worthy of a read. Um, so I would, um, I would encourage you to have a look at that. Also on our website is our current version of the Audit and Risk ma magazine. We have gone digital with our magazine, um, so please feel free to access it and have a read. There's some really good articles as you would expect. I'm also happy to take questions at any time. And I know some of you send me emails. My email address is liz, L-I-Z dot sandwith, S-A-N-D-W-I-T-H at I-I-A dot org dot U-K. Anything, um, I had one about um, what did I have one of? Oh, um, digital signatures. I had a question about that the other day. So please, it doesn't have to relate specifically to this. Um, any question that you might want to ask. Um, somebody asked me what my favorite wine was a few weeks ago. <laughs> I thought they went to send me a bottle, but it hasn't arrived. Um, so any question, please feel free. Um, join me next week. Next week, I want to look at the communications between the Chief Audit Exec, Head of Audit, and the Chair of the Audit Committee. And I'm going to look at that both from my position as a Chief Audit Exec who has spent 25 years reporting into audit committees, but also in my capacity as Chair of an Audit and Risk Committee. So what am I expecting from internal audit and what is internal audit delivering to the Audit Committee and do the two match? Don't forget your coffee and remember talk to internal audit the institute is listening and hopefully you can see all of the really brilliant things the institute is doing have a safe week um, enjoy the sunshine it is certainly beautiful in leeds blue skies and sun uh, stay safe thank you very much look forward to you joining me next week take care